Can you hear me as well? I hope so. Perfect. I will mute myself and I will listen just like the others. Thank Go ahead. You. So thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a real pleasure for me, despite the COVID emergency, as you can see. Therefore, I will start uh, talking about uh, some of, uh, you know, historical aspects of uh, that link immunity and metabolism in the context of regulatory T cells and also some specific work we've been doing over the last 10 years. So let's start looking at some key points regarding the uh, general aspect of intracellular metabolism that generally nowadays we have some dogmatic points that generally we look at thinking about different subsets of T cells, B cells and you know, immune cells like having a specific dominant or predominant metabolism. And this is a, I, I name it as a, let's say, a dogmatic view, because I think, and I will try to convince you at the end of this talk, that we should not be thinking in a, such a dogmatic, dogmatic way, because, you know, cells are really able to adapt to different microenvironmental stimuli, and they can change their metabolic, metabolic phenotype according to the situation. Therefore, despite the work that has been done over the last, you know, 10 years regarding link, the link between you know, activated CD4 cells mainly using glycolysis or TH17 mainly using glycolysis or TREG cells mainly using fatty acid oxidation or other cell types can be challenged a lot if we look at the context in which we are working. So once I start with this uh, concept, I think it's important for you to uh, focus on the main subject of this talk that basically is regulatory T cells. You know, regulatory T cells are a subset, a highly specialized subset of cells, which generally are, let's say, generated in the thymus or can be generated also in the periphery through specific treatment with the, in the context of uh, cytokines like TGFB and IL2 and can be generated in the periphery as well, particularly in the gut and also can be nicely generated from cells in vitro by treatment again with THFB and IL-2. These cells, okay, named as Tregs, are classically specified by the expression of the FOXP3 gene, which basically gives them the real commitment. And what is really interesting, and these cells have a uh, surface signature and also gene signature, which is generally linked to the fact that they express a lot of activation markers. So if we were not knowing that these were Treg cells because of the FOXP3, these cells, they resemble completely activated T cells. And in fact, if we look at their phenotype in the periphery, they are highly proliferative generally. So among the pool of T cells that are circulating in the blood, those that are more proliferative are Treg cells, those that are expressing FOXP3 in conditions of homeostatic balance in a normal individual not having specific, not having specific uh, you know, diseases at the moment. So T-Rex cells have those characteristics that have been really challenging our uh, interest over the last years because of their immunobiology. So they express the markers I told you, mainly the FOXP3 is the key gene. They can suppress a series of other cells like T-cells, B-cells, CTR responses. If they are isolated and transferred, can block our immunity. And this has been very nicely demonstrated over the last 20 years. They are generally either reducing in function or reducing in numbers in autoimmunity. And this is again a, a concept very important because of their function. So the ability to control immune responses. And they can be increased either during persistent infections or during like tuberculosis, for instance, or during tumor progression. Okay, these are main features of these cells. Do not forget, please, that they are highly proliferative cells generally in the periphery. Despite they are highly proliferative, this is, there is a paradox in the biology of these cells, which is being uh, uh, challenging our interest. They are hyper-responsive and allergic in vitro when we isolate them. So despite these are the most proliferative cells in vivo, when we put them in culture and we stimulate them, they do not respond despite they are alive. And this is a real, let's say, paradox, if we can think about it. So why T-reg cells, either human 
or mouse T. rex cells, once put in culture, are anergic. So they are alive, but they do not respond to PCR stimulation. And what and why this is, is this occurring? And how can we cope this aspect with the fact that they are, they are so proliferative in vivo? And at the same time with their function, is the anergic state they experience linked to their capacity to control proliferation of other cells? And how do we cope their concept that these are highly proliferative in vivo and control other cell proliferation, other cell effect of function, while they're highly proliferative, while in vitro they are anergic, but then they control as well proliferation in vitro. So I think that metabolism can give a lot of answers to this. And this has been basically the interest over the last 10 years in our lab. So these are the questions I've told you. So while these cells are hyper-responsive, they have a highly proliferative phenotype in vivo. And again, despite their anergic in vitro, and I'm responsive, they display an active phenotype in the surface. They express class two, they have CD69, they express CTLA4 that despite this molecule important in controlling proliferation, is also an activation marker. They express CD39, these are all activation markers, okay? So is it possible that metabolism can play a role in this context? Okay, to understand this question, so please bear in mind these two questions. I will have to give you some flashback on the historical part of immune metabolism. And the flashback is basically on some of my personal work, which started a long time ago in 1996, when I was 26 and working in London at Imperial College uh, uh, in Robert Leckler lab, where we started the, some, let's say, uh, very, very uh, uh, ancient immune metabolism work, linking the action of an hormone produced by adipose tissue named leptin, okay, which is produced by adipose tissue, and its capacity to control immune responses, particularly immune responses in the context of inflammation. And that time in 1996, when we were working, we had huge difficulties in in publishing this work because nobody basically was believing us. Immunologists were skeptical because they didn't know even that leptin was existing. And this hormone was cloned in 1994, so two years before our work. And also endocrinologists were not believing us because we were trying to link immunity and metabolism, you know, completely uh, far away things from, the, from each other. Today, we are not of this opinion, but at the time, believe me, it was very difficult. So going back to leptin, Leptin is, 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 is proportional to food intake because it is produced by adipocytes proportionally to the diameter of adipocytes. So more adipocytes we have, more leptin is secreted in the peripheral circulation, and heat inhibits food intake at hypothalamic level and controls basal metabolism. So basically leptin is important for activating our basal metabolism and controlling food intake by inhibiting food intake. In the periphery at the time, we discovered that leptin is able to control thymic, thymic uh, development and production of naive cells. But also particularly in the periphery is important because it boosts and maintains an appropriate capacity of our cells to respond against you know, pro-inflammatory stimuli, particularly cell-mediated immunity. And this is probably the reason why the proportion between adipose tissue and effective responses, particularly cell mediated responses, is important because the presence of leptin is a signal for the immune system that tells to the immune system that we have enough nutrients in the environment. So if we have enough nutrients, we will eat the nutrients. Eating the nutrients, we will put fat mass. If we put fat mass, we produce leptin. If we produce leptin, means that we have enough food in the environment. Therefore, if we have enough food in the environment, we have enough bricks and stones to build our immunity. In the absence of food, in the absence of nutrients, we cannot build enough immunity. So this is in a homeostatic situation in normal individuals. Therefore, it's very easy to postulate an equation. If we have no food around, there will be no fat. And in the absence of fat, there is no leptin. And if we have no leptin, we don't produce cell-mediated immunity. On the other side, if we have too much of food, too much of leptin because of too much of fat, too much of fat, too much pro-inflammatory responses in the periphery. 
Okay, so this is our starting point, focusing on the amount of leptin produced and the amount of effector responses in the periphery. You have to think at the time, this was very hard for, hard for us to be demonstrated. Also because nobody was believing us that an hormone produced by fat could affect immune responses. But we were quite lucky in finding it. Therefore, as leptin, sorry, is important for effector responses, okay, boosting effector responses and dampening TH2 responses. What is occurring when we give to the system signals of starvation, okay? We name it as a pseudo-starvation because we were referring to drugs. But basically, the same effect is a starvation. If we starve the system, I go a little bit back, sorry. Okay, so if I starve an individual or if I starve, I reduce leptin production because adipocytes go down. I can have the same effect if I use drugs that mimic reduction of leptin. Which drug can limit reduction production of leptin? Well, drugs like rapamycin or leptin blocking antibodies have the same effect because basically either leptin signaling per se or through mTOR activation, which is linked to the leptin receptor, is a signal of starvation or pseudo starvation because we are not starving directly the individuals. Well, we were very, very surprised to observe that if I starve the system with either anti-leptin antibodies or rapamycin, I can reduce proliferation of conventional or effective T cells because I am starving their capacity to respond. But at the same time with these drugs, I could reverse the energic state of regulatory T cells in vitro. So a signal of pseudo starvation on the one side is able to reduce TCOM expansion and proliferation, but on the other is able to expand T reg cell proliferation and, pro and responses. Please bear in mind this concept because it will help us a lot to understand the, the immunometabolism of T cells, okay? So a cell that is responsive like T-com cell, if, I, if it is pseudo-starved during T-cell activation, will be inhibited. Okay, here, you can see it. This is the classical response, and this is the inhibition. On the other side, a T-reg cell that is allergic to TCR stimulation will be boosted to proliferate. So signals of pseudo-starvation basically induce tolerance because they induce more expansion of regulatory T-cells. The pivotal work to demonstrate this idea is basically this paper published by us in 2007, in which we found that leptin activates effector T cells. If I block leptin, you, you inhibit the proliferation. On the other side, leptin inhibits expansion of T-reg cells. If I block leptin, I expand them. So the final outcome will be that if I block leptin or if I give a signal of pseudo starvation, basically I expand T-reg cells and I inhibit effector T cells. The final outcome will be more tolerance, more anti-inflammation. This effect was related to the fact that we could reverse T reg cell energy because when T cell, and this is another paper in 2010 we published, basically when a T cell, a T, -com, a, a, a T reg cell is energic, basically it's non-responsive because it's refractory, probably because it's coming from an environment where it's, where it's highly proliferative. Therefore, if I reduce the energetic state of these cells transiently with rapamycin treatment, these cells are rendered responsive, are not more refractory. And when I stimulate them with anti cd 3 cd 28 they can start to be proliferating. And this is due to the fact that leptin activates and overactivates mTOR pathway in vitro when we keep the cells in vitro. So this demonstrates that T-Rex cells are highly plastic through metabolic manipulation, either through leptin or either through mTOR levels. And it is well known that mTOR is very important for both either effector cells or T-reg cells responses. So this is basically the, the take-home message. So the biphasic and dynamic changes in mTOR activity are important for expansion of T-reg cells in vitro and in vivo. Short-term mTOR inhibition, either through anti-leptin antibodies or either through short-term rapamycin treatment can expand T-reg cells, while chronic inhibition of mTOR can reduce, unfortunately, the proliferation of these cells. So it's important the, 
you know, the transient inhibition of the system to allow expansion. Okay. Second point is that leptin through mTOR activation contributes also to the dynamic changes we observe during dietary changes. So every time we are eating, we are boosting the mTOR pathway through nutrients, glucose, nu uh, you know, amino acids and so on. And this affects the changes in the capacity of T-Rex cells to respond and to proliferate and their homocytic expansion in a whole human being. Okay, and of course, the, the idea that energy was something more related to the and a, a not, not active metabolic state has been abandoned because on the other side, energy probably is because in vitro, we have a high level of activation of the cells coming from a proliferative state. If we render them, if you stimulate them, they are energy because they are refractory because they, are, they were already highly proliferative. So if I stimulate a cell that is already proliferating, will not respond. On the other side, if I reduce the energetic level through leptin treatment, or uh, anti-leptin treatment or anti or rapamycin treatment, I render those cells able to respond to peripheral stimulation. These papers I showed you were published in 2007. And the paper were actually anticipating what was discovered by Diane Mattis, that T-Rex cells can homing, be homing into the adipose tissue. So we were publishing something which was then anticipating the notion that T-Rex cells not only are affected by leptin, but they are resident and accumulate in adipose tissue, which is the main source of leptin. Therefore, we were very happy when in 2009, it was shown that T-Rex cells can reside into the adipose tissue and can be affected by the adipose tissue. And they reside into the adipose tissue and they accumulate when we get fat. Sorry, they are lost, sorry, when we get fat, okay? and are classically accumulated in the fat because probably they are important to control the highly tuned balance of systemic metabolism through leptin production and maybe through other factor production because they contribute to the control of inflammation in the adipose tissue. And this idea I think was very important and we were very happy as well to uh, uh, that others confirmed the fact that T-Rex cells can be highly affected by adipose tissue biology. So let's move now I told you, you remember probably the first uh, image. I showed you the link and I said that we would don't have to think dogmatic when we think about intracellular metabolism. So this first part concentrated on systemic metabolism, how hormones produced by adipose tissue can control biology of immune cells like T-Rex and T-Com cells. At the same time, I told you that people were telling that, uh, you know, effector CD4 cells proliferating were mainly, mainly engaging glycolysis, while T-Rex cells were mainly engaging lipid oxidation. In the reality, this is not as exactly it is in the reality because we were thinking, okay, these cells are highly proliferative in vivo. When a cell, a T cell is highly proliferative, generally engages glycolysis. So we wondered whether the ex vivo isolated t human T-Rex cells were glycolytic or not. So we started some pr proteomic profiling Firstly, you see T-Rex cells are highly proliferative as a K67 expression. But also if you measure glycolysis as Iker and mitochondrial respiration, you will see that T-Rex ex vivo isolated from humans are highly glycolytic in basal conditions. And they do express much more than t cell enzymes linked to glycolysis, lipid synthesis, because they are proliferating. So they are making membranes and they do not express that much of beta oxidation enzymes or TCA cycles. This was also confirmed in proteomic analysis. In fact, as you can see, either in membranes or in cytosols, glycolysis was very on, and lipid metabolism, particularly as a uh, lipid synthesis, was on. So this confirmed nicely that T-Rex cells are ex vivo. When you take them from a human body, they are highly proliferative. What happens if we expand them through leptin neutralization in a context after they are rendered not anymore anergic? Well, they change a little bit their phenotype. And when we expand them with anti-leptin, they engage, yes, glycolysis, but also beta oxidation. This means that basically, when we analyze the biology of T-Rex ex vivo, they only express mainly 
glycolysis and lipid synthesis. While when we expand them in vitro, they express glycolysis plus beta oxidation enzyme. Therefore, it's not as exactly would be in vivo. Okay, so if we summarize, T-reg cell pool is highly proliferative, active mTOR pathway, uses glycolysis ex vivo, but in vitro also lipid synthesis. They have expression of activation markers, despite they are hyper-responsive and energetic in vitro. t pool is much, is much more simple because there is no glycolysis ex vivo. They have active FAO, no activation markers. They are responsive to stimulation, so they are very different. But the T-regs are much more sensitive to the metabolic changes because they are more active. And if you are more active, you can sense much more. You need much more from the environment. Therefore, you sense much more lipids, amino acids, and glucose, and so on, while the resting cell is much less sensitive. So the take-home message that I would like you to, to remember is that when you take ex vivo T-Rex, this is basically the phenotype, glycolysis and lipid synthesis. If you expand them in vitro, you need both, lipid oxidation and glycolysis. This should be really important thinking for us, because, you know, if we are aiming at using, you know, ex vivo and expanded t -reg cells, this can be a problem because in vitro, to grow them, we, need, we use two different types of, of metabolic responses. While if we have them in vivo, they use only mainly glycolysis. Is this going to affect any po potential of these cells as a therapeutic uh, strategies when we want to expand t -reg? Can be this important because we can lose even the phenotype or on the fox expression? And also, don't forget, what is occurring when we have a tumor growing? You know, a tumor that is growing, just to make you an example, basically provides to T cells a signal of pseudo starvation again, because it basically increases the, the conversion of T-com into T-reg cells. And the signal of pseudo starvation increases the capacity of the tumor to induce T-cell -reg -cell regulation and blocking the anti-tumor responses. Don't forget. So a pseudo submission tumor signal dampens t cell proliferation, increases conversion towards T-reg cells, and increases capacity of these cells to, to, to grow and expand. This is a paper we published recently. And again, tumor growing cells through expansion of basically glycolysis plus lipid synthesis boosts the production of T-reg cells that are blocking anti-tumor immunity in vitro in mice and in humans, we observe this phenotype. Therefore, it's very important that we, we, we think about the pseudo submission signals in general and also in condition like, you know, where you can boost them. Of course, we could use pseudo submission, okay? We could block pseudo submission during tumor growth or during, during uh, infections, for instance, or we can boost pseudo submission signals to boost tolerance in other immunity. So this is basically what we're thinking to, to do over time in our laboratory. Now, let's bring you some other examples in human settings. Is it possible that metabolic overwork, so too much of signals through metabolic signaling is affecting T-Rex cell proliferative responses because we are changing the way in which mTOR is engaged. As mTOR, I've told you, is necessary for T-Rex cell proliferation, but it's necessary only when it's oscillatory, not when it's constantly high or constantly low. So we used multiple sclerosis as a model, and we found that basically T-reg cells from individuals with MS have a reduced capacity to expand compared to normal individuals when we expand the T-reg cells through starvation signals, like mTOR uh, inhibition, either rapamycin or uh, uh, leptin signaling. So as you can see here, in MS patients, in my multiple sclerosis patients, they have a reduced capacity to expand rather than a reduced capacity to suppress, suppress t cell responses. And this is, the reason for this is because in MS patients, there is an overactivation of mTOR pathway. So mTOR pathway is overactivated. The fact that it's overactivated actually alters L2 signaling and also alters the expression of fox p splice invariants, which are very important in suppression of T-reg cells in humans during mm, diseases like MS. So this is another concept. The concept is that mTOR activation in MS patients reduces L2 signaling, 
alters the focus speed expression and reduces the capacity of TRX to expand because an overactive mTOR alters, despite it's important for TRX proliferation, if it is not oscillating, it will reduce the capacity of the TRX to expand. And it's what basically we have observed that if we link the capacity of TRX to expand ex vivo and we link it to the uh, clinical score of MS patients, as long as the clinical score is increasing, you will have a reduced capacity of TRX to expand. So we have not been focusing on the TRX suppression capacity, which was already shown to be reduced in these patients, rather to their homeostatic defect. So rather to their uh, capacity to not being able to expand in those patients. While in, in normal individuals like us, it's not occurring this. They can expand very nicely. So this is the model. If we have oscillation of mTOR, link it to the fluctuation of nutrients, we have a proper expansion of TREX cells and proper capacity to control inflammation. If we have too much of mTOR activity, TREX are not going to expand properly and we have immune dysregulation, we have autoimmunity, chronic inflammation, obesity, diabetes, or atherosclerosis, tumor, cancer. On the other side, we can have the same situation, but paradoxically the opposite, due to the low mTOR activity, even in malnutrition infections, where these processes cannot be uh, obtained, not because of too much signaling, but because of the opposite, but the final outcome could be the same. In this case, we have no autoimmunity, because probably malnutrition, extreme malnutrition, is in countries where we have uh, low hygiene, which is protective on the other side for autoimmunity. So let's move to the concept of oscillation in mTOR. Was all, we post postulated it in 2012 because of the paper we published on mTOR oscillations in 2010. We were very happy to observe that this idea was also maintained over time. And in 2017, David Sabatini, which is a maestro in mTOR activity, showed that basically in another system, in muscles, you can achieve muscle atrophy, atrophy either with too much mTOR activity or too low mTOR activity, okay? But you need oscillation of mTOR to achieve the optimal muscle function. So in a completely different system, not T-Rex cells, they found the same results as ours. Therefore, this means that probably it's a general mechanism that nutrients need to be oscillating to activate specific functions to be proper. If we have too much or too low, then we, have, we are in trouble. In this case, we are they were describing atrophy, muscle atrophy, and, but we were, we were describing you know, too much signaling, low function in T-Rex cells and their expansion. But if you think to the concept, it's the same, basically. So let's move now. We are nearly towards the end. I, will, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I was talking about systemic metabolism and leptin. Then I moved into the cells, glycolysis and T-Rex cell expansion. Now let's try to see whether mTOR can control fox expression and other signals can control mTOR expression. And how glycolysis can be important in T-Rex cell proliferation and fox expression. What we did, basically, we focused on the idea that it's very important, the master regulator in, in T cell expansion in general is the balance between high dose and low dose TCR engagement. So the TCR is crucial. If we have too much of TCR engagement, we have too much of mTOR, too much high mTOR signaling, no induction of T-Rex cells from T-COM cells. So now we switch from classically already committed T cells from the periphery into the mechanism that induces T-Rex cells from T-COM cells. So if we take a T-COM cell and very high dose of stimulation of the TCR, we have transient expression of FOXP3 because mTOR is too much signals, no T-Rex cell induction. While if we have low dose of antigen, we have TOR induction, particularly TOR2, but then we have a optimal FOXP3 expression. Therefore, low dose TCR signaling is helping to induce, uh, basically, is helping to induce a stable FOXP3. What we did, we used a strategy to induce TCOM cells, not using TGF beta, okay, not using high doses of IL2, but rather using weak TCR stimulation. So we strikingly observed that it is possible to induce T-Rex cells in vitro as inducible T-Rex cells simply using very low TCR stimulation in this absence of 
promoting TGFB or L2. So this is the classical way 99% of the labs use to induce T-Rex cells from TCOM. While we use simple weak TCR stimulation, no cytokines from the outside, no drugs from the outside. And after 36 hours, we have an optimal C25 expression and an optimal fox -V3 expression. Using this system, we measured what was the outcome. First of all, we observed that fox -V3 in humans, uh, we did not know in the origin that there were, there are like even up to 12 different transcripts for fox -V3. And among fox -V3 splice environments, those containing exon 2 and exon 7 are those more important in humans. Bear in mind that in mice, the mice do not express different splice variants. They, have, they express the full length. So while this uh, idea and concept can be applied to human cells, in the mice it's not possible because the mice do not express all these splice invariants. Strikingly, we published this paper showing that glycolysis drew, during the induction process of TCOM from TCOM cells to uh, fox p positive cells, uh, if we inhibited uh, with the uh, glycolysis, we could not achieve enough expression of fox pd splice environment, particularly those containing the exon 2, which correspond to 47 KD. This process was stat 5 dependent, as in patients with multiple sclerosis were not, were, were, were highly impaired, and particularly in twins with MS. So if we had a twin with MS, with multiple sclerosis and a healthy twin, the splice invariant we were, which were missing during the induction process were those containing the exon 2. And strikingly, we observed that in patients with MS, unexpectedly, TCOM cells, when were stimulated, they were reduced in their capacity to engage glycolysis in the very early stages. And this corresponded to a reduced capacity of MS patient to induce T-Reg cells. Therefore, while I showed you before in the Nature Medicine paper that circulating already committed T-Rex cells were unable to expand ex vivo, engaging glycolysis, the TCOM cells of patients with MS not only had a reduced capacity of already committed T-Rex cells to expand, but also the process of induction of T-Rex cells from TCOM cells was impaired because glycolysis was impaired in those patients. And being impaired glycolysis, they could not induce enough FOXP3 for their maintenance. While we were in, in, uh, activating the cells with a low TCR stimulation. So the model is this. In healthy subjects, if I engage enough glycolysis, enough but not too much glycolysis, a fraction of the cells that I activate will acquire the FOXP3 phenotype. And this phenotype will be maintained. Why the cells acquire the phenotype? Very simple. We found that the, an enzyme named enolase 1, which is part of the glycolysis, sorry, but the pointer is not working. Basically, the enolase enzyme, which is important from the glycolysis engagement, generally in resting situations, is sticking to the fox -P3 gene and is repressing the fox -P3, fox p 3 expression. When we engage glycolysis with low TCR stimulation, the enolase de-represses the FOXP3 gene, is engaged into the cytosol, and is busy in doing glycolysis. This allows a fraction of cells to acquire the phenotype with FOXP3 expression. This is normal individuals. In MS subjects, the enolase which is sticking as a repressor is not moving too much from the nuclei to the, to the, to the, uh, to the cytosols. Therefore, the capacity to induce enough TCOM cells is impaired. And of course, also the glycolysis is impaired. This is very important as a concept for all of us in all immunity. And there is this paradoxic link that if you not engage sufficient glycolysis, you are more exposed to develop all immunity. In fact, the, the counter proof for this is that drugs like interferon beta, which is important for, for treatment of MS patients, can reverse the impairment in glycolysis. You see? This is glycolysis engagement. After treatment with interferon beta, you have a, a reversal, and the FOXP3 gene is increased by interferon beta treatment, which is one of the uh, first line treatments for MS patients. So bear in mind this idea of glycolysis and the capacity to, to reverse, to induce enough T reg cell regulation during activation. As a final endeavor, I finished. 
we use another model of uh, genetic disease, a very simple disease, single gene mutation. In this case, it's glycogen storage disease, glycogenosis. So these patients, glycogenosis 1A and 1B, they have a defect in enzymes that are responsible for using glycogen storage. So this enzyme cuts the, the glucose from the glycogen, so allows cells to use glycogen, sto glycogen storages for engagement in glycolysis. So those individuals, incredibly, not the GSD1A, but the GSD1B defect, they have high frequency in autoimmunity. So those patients with glycogen storage disease 1B have high frequency of Crohn disease, high frequency of iliocolitis, high frequency also of uh, other type of, uh, you know, joint diseases. Why these patients with glycogen storage disease 1B have this problem? while they have myasthenia gravis as well, while the 1A, no. Well, the reason for that is the site of the mutation. The 1A have the mutation of this enzyme only limited to the liver. So only glycogen storage into the liver cannot be used. While 1B is systemic, including immune cells. So if immune cells are not able to use glycogen and glucose, they will not be able to engage glycolysis. Well, and this is the situation. You see, glycogen storage is 1B, don't engage glycolysis. Okay, you see, they don't engage glycolysis. And also, they engage uh, much less uh, uh, mitochondrial respiration. What is happening to their effector cells? And these patients have more autoimmunity. Well, if we look at the numbers of GSD1B, T-Rex, they are reduced in numbers in fox petri expression. They, have, they are less proliferative because they don't engage glycolysis. They suppress less and they express much less fox petri splice environment, particularly those expressing the exon 2. So this is a very simple model of defect in glycolysis engagement that demonstrates that if I don't enough engage glycolysis, I'm not able to have enough tolerance over time. So, this is the last slide. Let's try to summarize. We build glycolysis, sorry, we build tolerance through our life. We build tolerance through two mechanisms. Genetically determined, we have the thymus that produces thymic T-Rex cells. These cells are highly proliferative and glycolytic, and they enrich a, a, a pocket, a pool of T-Rex cells, like a sort of a, you know, a, a net with our eggs that we bring through our life. And this is genetically determined because the fox petri gene has to work, the IRA gene has to work, time acceleration has to work, and these are the T-Rex cells that come from the thymus, genetically predetermined. Our parents give us these genes. But then, the day after our birth, our delivery to the environment, the day after we are exposed to the environment, to bacterial colonization, to the gut, to the lung, to the skin that allows to enter our antigens. Therefore, what is more important? It's important that we are challenged by the environment. Every time TCOM cells are challenged, they engage glycolysis. And every time they engage glycolysis, a fraction of the cells will express Fox P3. And they will be becoming part of a pool of peripherally induced T-Rex, which will reach the net we bring through our life. Therefore, what is more important, the genetics or the environment? I would say, of course, both. If I have no genetics, I will have IPEX syndrome and I will have autoimmunity. But if I live in an environment which is not stimulatory enough to engage glycolysis and to stimulate my TCOM conversion into T-Rex, into the surfaces that are in touch with the environment, like the gut particularly, but then also the lung, we are living in a COVID environment today, or the skin, then I will not have enough T-Rex generation. And this nicely fits in the idea of uh, hygiene theory. So if we live in an environment where the environment is stimulating our immunity, then we generate tolerance much better than other environments. If we put all this together with metabolic pressure from an environment, so nutrients, we are all over feed, guys. We are all over caloric uh, attack, all of us despite we can be fitted in the gym, 
We are exposed in advanced countries to overload of glucose, nutrients, amino acids, and this is negative because this pressurizes our mTOR pathways so that they are very high and this alters generation of T-Rex into the thymus and their capacity to suppress, but also altered glycolysis. Because don't forget that glycolysis, if it is too much strong, it's too strong, then this again will alter the generation of these cells. So summarizing, immune, don't forget that tolerance is not preformed. Tolerance is built every day of our life. Like in, uh, you know, in neural systems or in psychiatry. When you, are, uh, when you are very young, you are not tolerant toward the environment. You are very strong. You are much more powerful. While you become old, you are experienced, and you build tolerance toward the environment. So there is no tolerance in the absence of T-cell activation, and no T-cell activation that can better induce tolerance. So this is the final message that I would like to give you. So metabolism and nutritional state are major driving forces governing survival obesity. Immunity and metabolism are tightly linked. And oscillation, and also the challenge from the environment, render the final outcome. So the open questions that I would like to leave you are, first of all, are T-reg cells and induction of expansion of those cells important? And of course, if we expand them in vitro, we need to bear in mind that in vitro is different from in vivo. Second possible, second important thing, can we metabolize, you know, can we change, can we change the outcome or responses through metabolic manipulation? Of course, yes. But you know, it's very important. Where are we going to touch? Com cells, T-reg cells, both in vitro, ex vivo. And finally, we have a, a big weapon. We can you know, work in the context of autoimmunity, metabolic dysregulation, cancer, infection, and so on. And finally, are we going to manipulate either systemic or intracellular metabolism? What is most important? Can we manipulate both? How are we going to cope with this? It's, not, it's still open, still open, despite we tend to think that this is easier. So let me thank all the people in my lab in Naples, the collaborators from the, you know, proteomic facilities in Milan, the neurology unit people that are working with us with patients and also the pediatrics and uh, the grant, the grant uh, agencies that support us. And finally, hopefully after the COVID situation, please come to Napoli to meet us and give me a shout if you are coming in our country. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Giuseppe. Normally there would be a big applause now, but uh, unfortunately that's not the case. Uh, maybe nice for you to know we have we had 175 visitors and, and wow. watchers, so that's more than than wow. what you would get uh, in Amsterdam. So that's, <laughs> that's really nice to hear. Uh, I really enjoyed, and I also liked how you put this complete immunometabolism yeah field in the perspective of of systemic metabolism, feeding, and actually life in the end. Yeah. Maybe this calls for a, a review or a perspective from your side uh, along this line. I remember Ruslan Medzitov doing a very nice one on the evolutionary perspective on the immunometabolism in science last year. I was thinking along that line when you were presenting and putting yeah. it all in perspective of, of live also. So this is uh, actually very nice and uh, lots of room for discussion, I would say. I'm here. I'm here with the so, mask. You want there were... <laughs> There were quite yeah, some questions. Just to, you know, to, to relax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, there were quite some questions raised and uh, we, can, we can certainly uh, pick a few. Uh, one of the questions from Mariolina was whether besides the, the nutritional state, um, the, so being leptin and, and feeding, these mTOR oscillations um, are also prone to circadian rhythms and whether that could uh, affect the things you're looking at. Yeah, for sure there is, uh, is something I would love to do. Believe me, for lack of, you know, you cannot do everything, but I'm more than happy, you know, to, to provide any sort of insight, uh, reagents, whatever, uh, to, to pick up this point. Because of course, uh, 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 circadian oscillations are huge and important. Just that you know, for instance, the leptin, as a circadian oscillation that is opposite to cortisol. So basically cortisol that is up at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, leptin is very low and the opposite in the evening. So they are opposite in this way. But of course, there is also uh, the boost of leptin when we eat because the stomach uh, uh, epithelia can produce leptin as well, independent by the fat. 
and it goes into a balance with ghrelin. So it's very uh, nice and huge, the possibility to be investigated. And of course, I'm more than happy to be here. And I personally did not investigate. Uh, the few things that I know are what I told you, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, very important question. Um, there's just a new question from Pascal Mensa. Um, and he raises the hypothesis whether the nutritional state of our society could be the cause of um, tolerance and increased inflammation and whether this might explain the, the COVID-19 outbreak. Yeah, uh, this is, a, if you can, uh, uh, this, 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 uh, this, um, this colleague, uh, we, we uh, published a, a, a perspective in Nature Immunology in, in uh, 2017 named the rule of metabolic pressure in the breach of self-tolerance. Now, if we look, I'm convinced that COVID outbreak can be, of course, partially due to the fact, I would be the first of all very curious to see whether the outbreak in less developed countries and uh, uh, less affluent countries would be the same. I, I my feeling is that it's not gonna be the same for many reasons. Hygiene, first of all, we are more trained in a way to the people that are in, in less developed countries, but also because of metabolic pressure, because all of us in advanced countries and even China now that is much more increasing the, the degree of, uh, you know, of, of being exposed to metabolic pressure. Uh, basically, as long as you, we are more inflamed because we have overactive metabolic pressure, which is pressing on mTOR, pressing on nutrient energy sensing pathways. And this is reducing the capacity of our T-Rex cells to be generated on the one side and to expand to uh, uh, homeostatically maintain. Therefore, I'm sure and convinced that if you have diabetes and maybe hypertension, you are already inflamed because high, high glucose act overactivates. So people that are diabetic, either type one or type two, they are both overinflamed because you overactivate the nutrient energy sensing pathways. Therefore, if you if your concern when we are exposed to COVID is the hyperinflammatory syndrome you will have more hyperinflammatory syndrome. In fact, this is explained by this. Second point, don't forget that in the case of leptin, but also insulin, leptin is hugely expressed on the endothelial cell as a receptor. Therefore, if you have a lot of leptin around, and if you are obese, you will have much more activated endothelial cells, and they may be expressed much more ACE2 receptor, which is the receptor of the virus. So I, I, I'm... I'm not the experimental proof for that, but for sure there will be something to be explored regarding this and the leptin pathway and the immunometabolic uh, situation. So these are probably things we will learn in the in the next couple of years, I assume. For sure, for sure. There um, were two, yeah. So there, there were also two questions related to to ex vivo culturing and how this metabolic profile consisting of both glycolysis and oxidation would still be the case if you would uh, uh, culture T Rex in more hypoxic stage or more physiological uh, oxygen. Uh, yeah, you are right. Like. In fact, in fact, my I, I completely agree. In fact, in fact, uh, uh, one main problem we have in our in vitro culture, if you think. Oxygen doesn't change while our cells that recirculate are exposed to in the lungs to high oxygen pressure and low CO2 while in the tissues they are exposed to low oxygen. So our cells are constantly oscillating not only in terms of nutrients but also in terms of oxygen and CO2 first of all. Second, the static environment of in vitro culture is static. You know the RPMI contains 500 times the amount of amino acids we have when we eat. 500, 500 times, not one, 500. <laughs> so this is huge. Third, don't forget, use of fetal bovine serum. Fetal bovine serum is completely non-physiologic because it's from a pregnant cow. So we have a huge amount of leptin, huge amount of placental hormones, uh, progesterones, estrogens, you know how big is a cow? Huge amount of GH. So all our cultures are uh, contaminated by, a, let's say, we study uh, immunology of a pregnant cow with ourselves. 
you think about it. Uh, so my suggestion would be try to use systems in which those changes are reflecting what is occurring in a human body. So changes, dynamic changes in oxygen, dynamic changes in nutrients. So we should think about and ask you know, the dealers to construct incubators or cell culture systems where we have those changes to really think about what is the physiology of in vitro cultures. So I completely agree with the, with the colleague that we, have, we are studying slices of the reality. We are not studying the real world, unfortunately. I, I fully agree. And this is obviously a, a question in the field and how to relate in vitro Absolutely. to in vivo, Absolutely. mouse to humans. So these are things we're all dealing with. No doubt. Um, no doubt. In fact, don't take me wrong. I don't have the solution for that because I study cells in the vitro culture which are static. But you know, it's a problem. We, we, the important thing is that you need to be aware that it is a problem and not uh, trying to extrapolate your results to the in vivo, to the clinic, because sometimes you can be big, big disillusioned. Sure. But the, fa the fact that, that people raise these questions means that they're aware, so that's good. Hey, we also have uh, David Finley watching. He was here uh, next week as a presenter. He, he raised two questions. So since he uh, put so much effort and time in presenting, we, we will address both of them. The okay. first is a very short one, and he asked whether human T-Rex contain uh, glycogen stores. Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. They, they, they capture a lot of glucose. A lot. A lot. So they can capture a lot, much more glucose than other cells, than the typical okay. T-com cells. But I don't know whether they have uh, glycogen storage. I don't know. Very important question. Yeah, and, and then it also came with the interesting question, whether we have an idea whether um, individuals that are leptin deficient have, have uh, functional defects in their T cell uh, development. Yes, we published a long time ago uh, a paper on that. Uh, actually, we found that the, the, the babies that have leptin deficiency, they have much less naive cells, so much less CD4 cells than normal individuals, normal babies, okay? And when you treat them with leptin... Yeah, that's the, the follow-up question. Yeah, when you treat them with leptin, they, you go back. So basically, they have both defects in T-Rex and in CD4 cells, okay? When you give them leptin, you restore the thymic function. So the naive cells will be back and the T-Rex will be back. Right. At that time, when we started that time, POX P3 was not cloned. So we only looked at CD4, C25 cells. Okay? It's a JCI paper, 2002, 2001. Okay. Um, we'll shortly have to conclude, but we'll address a few more questions here, if yeah. we have time. Example. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and, and the only one in the building. <laughs> so I'm here. I think I think this is uh, Royce in uh, Luftus uh, raising the question whether an overactive mTOR in this hypernutrition state uh, impact PPAR activity in the T-Rex. Uh, I have not. I have not investigated that. Uh, it could be. It could be. It, because that could also relate to overnutrition to yeah, one of the suppressive effects of, of not only T-Rex, but also T-cells, macrophages, and other immune cells. Okay, I would suggest for this question, people abused thiazoline dions, so activators of PPAR gamma, to complement first-line drug treatment in multiple sclerosis patients. So if you add PPAR gamma activators, okay, plus first-line drug treatments, the MS patients get much better and they get much more T-Rex cells, okay? So maybe this answers the question. Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, if you give to those patients either Tiazolindiones or metformin, which activates AMP kinase and downregulates mTOR partly, you get much more T-Rex because you sort of reverse the overactivation of mTOR. I hope you got the point. And yeah, I hope yeah. that's the question. Yeah, I think that I, some other, yeah. I have not investigated directly this, but the clinics helps us. So there is this paper published by uh, Jorge Correale in, uh, in JAMA. So quite a respect, uh, JAMA Neurology, 
uh, where they published very recently that treatment with these two drugs, you complement and you enhance very nicely first-line drug treatments in multiple sclerosis patients. So don't forget that thiazolindiones, metformin, rapamycin, despite completely different mechanisms, they give pseudo-starvation signals, what I've told you. So you enhance TREG, reduce TCOM. Yeah. Maybe a last question, and that's, that's a personal one, and I, I, you already touched upon that uh, in, in your last slide. So if you think from uh, a therapeutic perspective, yeah. do you see ways to specifically uh, target the T-Rex, or are there specific features, metabolic features, maybe in T-Rex that could be addressed without affecting other cells, immune cells, or, or other cells? Do you have a, uh, ideas along that line? You think about, you are talking about uh, more drugs as a, as a signal, signal of pseudo-starvation? Yeah, or... indeed. I mean, if you think about inducing tolerance or breaking tolerance in the context of, of diseases wh wh where you want to yeah, push it in one of, or the other direction. Okay, my feeling is that I will, I'm, I'm very much intrigued by the idea of giving short time touching the system and then removing the drugs rather than giving, because, you know, we tend to give chronic treatments, rapamycin, metformin, and so on, and they work. I'm not saying that they're not working. I would be more, you know, happy in sort of stimulating with pulses treatments that can change, switch the phenotype of the cells, and then induce a response which is maintained over time, rather than continuously giving drugs, because otherwise we continue treatments, you induce counter-regulatory mechanisms that over time we lose the efficacy in terms of immunometabolism. But this maybe can be extended to many others. Okay, right, this would right, be my right. idea. That that's okay. probably yeah. makes sense. Then you switch the balance and the opportunity of, of resetting the system and then yeah. allowing yeah. other kind of therapies or what, yeah. uh, what people are trying to achieve you know with intermittent fasting as well, which is a, not drug, but behaviorally induced changes. You know, pulses and then removal, pulses and then, because the systems, as I told you, if I use rapamycin chronically, I inhibit mTOR and I stop t to grow. While if I give a pulse, they grow very nicely. And this goes toward the, the idea of that. Okay, right. so maybe we are not thinking about it because we are concerned that, you know, if you give one shot or few shots over time, you are not as efficient. We have, you have not that efficacy as it would be with current treatments. But I think we have to switch our mind. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting uh, perspective on that. Thank you for that. And, and thanks a lot for the, for the interesting presentation and, and discussion. I really enjoyed and I think people also enjoyed. Uh, you can leave feedback on Twitter or by email or wherever. Fantastic. I will share the, the questions with you also. Yeah, anyone um, which wants to contact me, please uh, drop me a note, an email, whatever, I'm here. Very nice and very it's kind. Of you. Over the last, uh, the, the next few days, uh, no, no problem. Very happy very good to, to know. To collaborate, share ideas. Uh, we are here. Fantastic. So thanks a lot, uh, Giuseppe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next week we'll be here again with David Ferrick. He's from Agilent Technologies, but it won't be a commercial talk. If he, if you saw him presenting before, you know that he's a very good and uh, animating presenter. He has very nice perspectives on the field. So I really look forward to his presentation. So that's again on Wednesday at four. And yeah, meanwhile, you can follow us on Twitter or uh, follow the, the latest updates on the, on the website. So thank you all for watching. Thank you, uh, Giuseppe, for the nice presentation. And I hope to see you soon in real life. Thank you Bye very much. Goodbye to everybody. Bye.